Hello, today on my channel you will hear an amazing story about life. I hope you enjoy this story. This one struck me to the core. Honestly, I still can't forget it. Enjoy watching. Jacob was convinced that some days are so nice weather-wise that they're not meant for work at all, and it's a crime to work on them. But what can you do on even the nicest spring day when you have a mortgage to pay, a credit card debt thanks to an obnoxious ex, and a broken down car? So he went to work on this sunny April morning to the office where he knew this day would be like all the previous ones and all the ones to come. Damn it. Jacob reproached himself once again for having chosen to become a manager instead of a marine biologist. The only good thing about today, by the way, was the broken car, because I could honestly say I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm not used to public transportation, so I was late. In fact, Jacob didn't even go to the public transportation stop but instead walked briskly through the picturesque courtyards that still had the spirit of old New York. In one ear, a fancy invisible earpiece to listen to a podcast from your favorite blogger, in my hand a cup of latte coffee with alternative milk. Yes, you may be 30 years old, but Jacob felt no older than 23. There was something rebellious in his mood today, a kind of desperation bordering on despair, a desire to change his life abruptly. Help, help. A woman's pitiful voice cut through his detached, withdrawn mind. Jacob stopped, his head spinning. Please, help my little boy. He saw her and recognized her. No, Jacob didn't hang around homeless people. He hadn't even given them alms since the bun had gone into the trash, and he'd been cursed for not giving them a bill. But it was just that this particular character from the category of iconic lunatics of our city was familiar to him. I think her name was Ariana. This overgrown, shaggy-haired woman of indeterminate age, ranging from 30 to 60. She usually walked around with her arm outstretched and a cardboard box around her neck, babbling nonsense, like how she'd been kidnapped by evil scientists for medical experiments, like how she was a princess and should live in the palace. But right now Ariana, changing her usual clumsy slowness, was rushing along the narrow embankment of one of the canals and literally throwing herself at passers-by, shaking her hands. The passers-by, who, by the way, were not to be blamed here, would scramble away and hurry to get away. It was a natural reaction when a crazy woman yells that her baby has to be rescued, that it's been taken by a waterbender, but something made Jacob stop. It was one of the most sluggishly flowing canals in the city, and it looked like a swamp, with shrubs, sedges, and reeds clinging to the greenish water below. What happened? Jacob asked, did someone fall in there? Sonny. The waterman will carry him away. Ariana squealed. Jacob grimaced at the stench of her stink and walked over to the fence and leaned over it. He was about to say there was no one there, but then he noticed. Just under the bushes, where the canal still had a strong current, a little boy stood almost up to his neck in the water. He was holding onto the branches with his arms up, numb with fear. Where he stood, the bank of the canal sloped sharply, almost steeply downward, and it was easy to imagine what would happen if this boy of about five years old were to fall. Jacob darted away from the fence, along the canal, to where the old ladder went down. Quickly, quickly, the shore was a broken leg because the locals had decided it was the perfect place for a garbage dump. And though they cleaned it regularly, the unconscious part of the population was littering it all over again. Boy, hold on, I'll save you. Jacob panted, clinging to the branches himself. The child looked up, his eyes huge and tears streaming down his face, but he couldn't bear to cry. He must have been so frightened that his instinct was to freeze. Jacob was about to reach for the boy, but suddenly the branches slipped from his hands and he fell into the canal. There was a scream. Jacob, not thinking about anything, rushed after him and almost broke his legs. It wasn't that deep, but for the shock boy who had fallen to his death, it could have been a very bad end. I got him. I got him. Breathe, breathe, breathe. Hey kid, it's okay. Don't cry, it's okay. Jacob said as he and the child slowly climbed to the shore. Passersby finally paid real attention to what was going on. People crowded around the top of the canal. Some came down and held out their hands to help them get out. Some took pictures on their phones. And when Jacob finally got out, some even clapped their hands and shouted, Man, you're a hero, whose baby? exclaimed a woman wearing a funny gray beret adorned with fake feathers. That's your son. 
Why didn't you watch out, Daddy? It's not mine, Jacob answered hastily. The boy still holding the baby was breathing, coughing and sobbing. It's, where is she? His mother was standing here. In general, it was strange to imagine that someone like Ariana could have a child. But on the other hand, Jacob thought he wasn't, aha, observing homeless people in their natural habitat like a naturalist, was he? So anything's possible. And the boy, by the way, Jacob thought, looked surprisingly decent for being Ariana's son. He's covered in canal mud, of course, but he's still dressed well, well fed. Whose baby is it? We should call an ambulance. The lady of the barrack continued. Is she your mother? Jacob asked the boy. The woman was standing there. Her name is Ariana. No, answered the boy and sniffed his nose. My name is Frederick. I don't know Ariana and she's not my mom. I don't have a mom. My mom died a long time ago. I want to go home. Frederick suddenly shouted and Jacob hurriedly put him down. Where do you live? He asked. The passersby were not going anywhere. They stood and watched the situation curiously. Jacob felt stupid for some reason, and he was cold too, because the morning was clear but not warm, and he'd been soaking wet while he'd been in the canal. Why are we standing like idiots? Suddenly exclaimed one guy in the crowd, an intelligent-looking blonde guy in a coat and glasses, the child is wet, and you too? Let's go somewhere. There's a cafe over there. Jacob doubted at first that such a dirty group would be allowed into the cafe, but they sat him and Frederick down at a table, offered to take off their clothes to dry them, and brought hot drinks, coffee and a sandwich for Jacob, and cocoa and cookies for Fee. I live in the woods, Frederick said. What forest? Asked the owner of the cafe, her name was Angelica, and she happened to be in the cafe today. In the emerald, added Frederick, taking a sip of cocoa. It made a funny, milky mustache appear on the boy's face. What nonsense, Jacob said. Emerald Forest is a cottage community not too far away, said the blonde intellectual. I don't live there myself, he explained, but I often go there to tutor English part-time. Well, well, wait a minute. He pulled out his phone. I have the phone number of the security guard there, and she knows all the locals. Let's call and find out. All around froze. Everyone was eager to know the result. Finally, the other side answered. The blonde guy didn't talk long. Yes, they really do have a Frederick living there. Frederick, Sarah Berestova's son. This morning they let him go with his nanny to the zoo. Sarah, you say? Asked one man several witnesses to the incident pulled up from the canal following the rescuer and the rescued in the cafe. The oligarch who? Well, she is a businesswoman, answered the blonde man and took off his glasses, took to wipe them, and what does it matter? So maybe there will be a reward for saving the boy. Some grandfather asked a question. What's that got to do with it? Jacob shouted nervously, who wanted nothing more than to hand the boy over to his family and go home. Because I should have changed, because it wasn't a good idea to show up to work in wet pants. While they were talking, the blonde had already dialed the house where Sarah lived. The answer was not her personally, but the maid. In about 20 minutes they will arrive, the guards will take the child. And the mother? Ask the honor the bear, people. What kind of a mother is that, huh? No, I'm asking you. She looked around the audience with an indignant look, her child almost drowned, and she, you see, sent strangers after him. I was told Sarah was in a meeting. She's in an important business meeting, the blind man said, as if he had something to do with what had happened. Hey kid, Jacob said to Frederick, who had fallen silent, concentrating on his second cup of cocoa and his second batch of cookies. You said your mom died. Yeah, nodded the little guy, no real mom. Sarah is my foster mom but I love her. She's like my mom. Yeah, stretched out someone in the audience. That's the story. Okay, you know what? Jacob got up from the table. If it's okay and the baby's going to be taken away, I'm out of here. I have my own things to do, plans. Good luck, Frederick. Don't get lost, he said and waved to the boy and left the cafe. Home. To change. To rush to work. Yes, Jacob could have told him what the good reason was for his tardiness but it was Harry's department head who was telling him he was late. He was the kind of guy who was hired because he knew his bosses and then went to work for his paycheck and to make fun of the people around him. Yeah, Harry had a bad temper. Not a major, but a millionaire with the trappings of a millionaire. Who doesn't have millions? The word around the office was that he'd end up badly one day. Anyway, 
Jacob said that yes, he was just late for personal reasons, and he promised not to do it again. And then he went to his workstation in the cubbyhole under the air conditioner and immersed himself in papers. The workday went fine. Then Jacob left the office and went home. He grabbed a pizza for dinner because he wasn't in the mood to stand at the stove. He called his mom twice a week. Plus, he stopped by once on the weekend. Finally, he went to bed. Jacob fell asleep with a smile on his lips because tomorrow was Friday and therefore a well-deserved vacation was just around the corner. Jacob had an unusual and special dream. In it, he was wandering along the outskirts of the city as it had been 200 years ago. The area was still full of dense forests, and fog flowed from their edges. Jacob was lost in the fog, which was emerald green for some reason, and now he couldn't find his way back. He shouted, "Ow!" but his own echo echoed. Then Jacob realized he was in a swamp. A green carpet with scarlet beads scattered about, as if someone had heard himself. He didn't realize it was cranberries. Jacob fell to his knees, and the bog smacked wetly and softly beneath him. He reached for the fruit, scooping up handfuls. He scattered them, sent them to his mouth, and couldn't get enough of their sour juiciness. Suddenly a hand appeared out of the bog window right in front of him. Jacob screamed and recoiled, wanted to jump up, but the swamp had no solid ground beneath his feet. He fell, floundering. Meanwhile, the thing that sat at the bottom, with an effort, sprang out a second hand, a paw with long claws, as if they were steel size, and then the creature's head appeared, and it looked like a drowned tree stump, on which a master carver, clearly mad, had carved human features. The creature opened its eyes, and there was a cosmic, bottomless blackness in them. It opened a slit in its mouth, and a thick slurry of tina spewed out, followed by a frog. Jacob couldn't move, his body stiff with cold terror. But the creature, moving with a jagged squeaking motion while its lower body was still in the swamp, came closer. Oh, Jacob, the creature muttered with a nasty chuckle, what have you done? Why did you take my prey? I'm sorry. I just saw the boy drowning. So what? The creature grinned. Oh, Jacob, what am I going to do with you now? Please let me go. Jacob cried in his sleep. Maybe I've let go. The creature thoughtfully raised his hand to the driftwood and scratched at his beard, from which several hissing vipers immediately emerged. But who will go to the kingdom of the watermen to live now and eh? Or maybe you'll bring another boy again. Eh? No, Jacob tried to crawl away from the fearsome creature. Then it must be that, though the swamp creature had no eyes in the ordinary sense of the word, Jacob could feel it staring. It stares down to your bones, to your soul, to your most primal human being, scratching such horror out of your heart that it takes you completely into its grip. So you'll go instead. Do you agree? The driftwood's hands rushed forward, slammed into his floundering body, and dragged Jacob into the swamp. And then he woke up. The alarm clock was playing a tune, the sun was shining through the window, and the sparrows were chirping. Jacob stood under the shower much longer than usual that morning, as if he needed to, as if by soaping himself for the fourth time he could wash away the sticky memories of his nightmare. He got to work minute to minute. Harry gave his subordinate a telling look that said, if you stumble one more time, I'll show you. The day stretched on with the usual coffee break, then lunch. And then suddenly visitors came into the office, and everyone turned their heads. It was the stately blonde beauty of the breed that usually adorned the covers of magazines. A cream-colored business suit, a scarlet trench coat thrown over her shoulders, stiletto heels on her feet. She was accompanied by the director of the firm that occupied the office. He was talking to her in a subservient manner, and under the puzzled and curious stares of the office dwellers, she walked to the desk where Jacob was sitting. Yes, that's me, he replied confusedly, rising when she called him by his first and last name, and what is your business? Instead of answering, the beautiful woman suddenly hugged him, tight, tender, and hot. Jacob gasped for air. Then, pulling away, she said she was very, very grateful to him for saving her son. You're a real hero, Sarah said. It's okay, I just... Jacob felt embarrassed enough to do what anyone in my position would have done. And yet you were the only one who saved him, she said, and Jacob realized that he was. Well, to put it mildly, drowned in her brown eyes, I don't know how to thank you. But first, she handed him some sort of card, it's Frederick's birthday on Sunday. I think it would be great if you came. He was asking about where his superhero was, Sarah smiled. Thank you, I'll think about it, mumbled Jacob. Then the beauty said, 
goodbye and left, and Jacob was left confused, with an invitation and a lot of attention from the whole office. His colleague Steve, a trainee, a student from yesterday, and a very cooperative and smart guy, was the first to say something. Jacob shrugged his shoulders, but then sighing and looking around at his colleagues, he told them what had happened. Everyone listened attentively, asking questions, sighing, and one of the women even cried because of the tragic nature of some of the moments in the story. The director of the firm patted Jacob on the shoulder and said he was proud to work with such a man. Anyway, by the end of the day Jacob, without expecting or wanting to, had gained a lot of publicity at his job. On the way back from work, part of which he decided to walk to clear his head after the day's experiences, Jacob thought about whether he should go to the party. Technically, yes, he had saved the boy, and he would probably be upset if he didn't show up at his birthday party. But he didn't want to be the sender of attention about the rescue again, I didn't. Jacob strongly suspected that the society there would be, well, high society. It was clear to which circle this Sarah belonged, a businesswoman, a socialist. But Jacob was even more disturbed by his own first impression of her. What was he, a hormone-driven green boy? So what if she was pretty? He'd known beauties, they're all about fancy clothes, and getting all the money out of a man. But this Sarah seems to be making it on her own. From what he'd heard in the office, Jacob realized she was in the plastic container business. So, what was the choice to go or not to go? While Jacob was deciding this important question, he accidentally bumped into a man. Actually, this man was not particularly noticeable from the usual level, because he squatted down, picking up cans scattered on the asphalt. Jacob, who almost fell on him, apologized. Then he recognized him as the intelligent-looking blind man who had called Frederick's family. The bag had torn, the blind man said, and Jacob leaned over to help. Soon the canned goods, a few packets of tea, bread, and a few other things were stuffed into another whole bag. Thanks for helping me out, Jacob said. Without you, we'd have been looking for so much. It's nothing, he smiled. I'm lucky to get into stories all the time. I couldn't even deliver the material aid to my sponsored girl. What? Jacob didn't understand. Well, I sometimes visit people who need help, but I answered, not just me, but from the foundation. And then he named the Charity Foundation that was a household name in the city that came to the aid of lonely old people, helped the homeless get off the streets. By the way, I never introduced myself. The blind man held out his hand, Archie. It's nice to meet you, Jacob replied, but I don't help. I don't trust them. I think a lot of them are to blame for the way they live. That's partly true, Archie sighed, but sometimes circumstances can be terrible, and they push people over the edge. Take Ariana, she's a former artist and writer. Ariana? Are you going to see her? Jacob asked. Yes, you guessed it. Archie smiled. She's been our sponsor since March. She was on the canal then. Jacob began to recount the circumstances of the boy's whereabouts. It's strange. Archie said thoughtfully, I thought Ariana had been doing a lot better lately. I apologize for being blunt, but I thought her head had gotten a lot better. But who knows, I had only been to see her the day before this incident and I'm on my way to see her now, to drop off some groceries. So she's not homeless? Jacob asked. No. She spends a lot of time on the street, but she has a room in a communal apartment. It's amazing how she hasn't gotten drunk with them and how she behaves and Archie clarified that the room wasn't Ariana's property. She lived in it as it were, thanks to a woman's mercy. So she sort of saved the boy. Well, she noticed he was down, Jacob wondered. Well, okay. Goodbye. Good luck out there. And he went on his way. Actually, he was tempted to go with Archie to Ariana's. But then he thought, why should he? He had his own life. Saturday was a busy day, first of all. Jacob stopped by his parents' house. Their relationship was generally good, but his mother and father had made him realize at the age of 18 that they had raised him, and that you should be independent and let us live with you. But Jacob's mother still continued to control her son. And in many ways, he married Lucy in spite of her. He just wanted to prove that he was capable of making up his own mind about his life, especially since Lucy had been his girlfriend since college, and it seemed that they were made for each other. But then Lucy suddenly became dissatisfied and demanding. So she reproached Jacob with the fact that he had not yet reached the big boss, and accordingly, did not earn much. A painful, difficult divorce followed, at the end of which Lucy emptied Jacob's credit card, and now he had a debt of 200,000, 
the payment of which, together with the mortgage payment, made him tighten his belt for more than two years so that it was sometimes sickening to look at the world. Jacob sometimes didn't understand his mother at all. She loved to nag him for the slightest slip up, but when he asked for advice, she told him he was a big boy and had to live on his own. She demanded that he come every weekend, but she didn't want him to talk about himself. Instead, he had to sit and listen to gossip about all the family that his mother thought he should be interested in for some reason. Jacob left his parents' apartment in the afternoon and went straight to the mall. He decided that he would go to Frederick's birthday party, but now he had to decide on a present. It seemed like a simple thing to choose a present for a five-year-old. Not when that child's mommy is a millionaire. What to give him? A gold-plated rocking horse? A gingerbread house the size of an apartment? Jacob sighed having to get into the budget, which is already small. Finally, wandering in the rows of the toy store, he found a girl consultant and almost tearfully asked to suggest him something inexpensive, but suitable for a boy of five years old, who has everything. Buy the bear, said the consultant, it's a universal best gift for longer than a century. Here, a new collection from the brand, and she began to spell out the merits of the soft toys. Jacob didn't understand much and simply said, I'll take it. He also asked that the gift be wrapped appropriately. He went home in a more or less normal mood. The next morning, Jacob ironed his best suit and was nervous about tying his tie. He hoped that this party would not be a feast with a thousand pieces of cutlery that he didn't know how to use. He was a simple man. He had to avoid embarrassment. He got there first by bus, then by cab. Finally, Jacob was dropped off at the mansion, where he showed the invitation, and was allowed inside. And then he breathed a sigh of relief, because on the lawn in front of the two-story mansion was an ordinary noisy and colorful children's party. There was a bouncy castle, suspended toy donkey filled with candy, there were clowns walking around, music was playing, animators in silly costumes were jumping, cotton candy and grilled sausages smelled sweetly. We've been waiting for you. Jacob almost jumped when Sarah came up to him. She looked nothing like she had when they first met. She was dressed in simple jeans and a white t-shirt, not a drop of makeup on her face, her hair in a ponytail. But that's the only way she was even more beautiful. You've come. With a happy squeal, as only the little ones who believe that everything in the world is possible, Frederick came at them. Hi, buddy. Jacob scooped the boy up in his arms. How are you? No sneezing? No, the boy smiled. My mom gave me some pills. Moms are like that, Jacob said, but she loves you. You have to listen to her. Okay, boy, I have something for you. A present? Yay. Another present, explained the boy and grabbed the toy box and looked at his mom. Can I? You know the rules, she replied, we open presents after, after the holiday. Okay, nodded the boy and ran to the table and left the box on it. There were other gift wrappers piled on top of it. Jacob didn't count them, but he realized the boy must have gotten enough to open a toy store. Strange, he realized, because usually the kids open the store right away. It's a family rule, Sarah said. I see, said Jacob, who didn't want to argue about parenting techniques, even if he thought they were wrong. She took advantage of the fact that her son was busy and took Jacob to meet the guests. He was again praised for saving Frederick. His hand was shaken. He was talked to. And a man with a business card said, if you want a good job, call me. Jacob was a little insulted. Jacob was a little offended by that. He didn't want any handouts from rich people. Maybe his job wasn't perfect, but it wasn't a crony job. And whatever he had, he deserved. I beg your pardon. A cup of non-alcoholic punch splashed on Jacob's suit. He rounded his eyes because Archie had swooped in and spilled it on him. It was clear he'd been brought to the party by Sarah's neighbor, Archie's tutor. He had brought him to brag to the other parents about what a great English teacher his daughter had. Archie didn't mind the publicity at all. He said he could get new clients that way. I couldn't do it, Jacob admitted just. I wouldn't be able to hang around in that circle. Why not? Archie grinned. They seem like regular people. No horns, no tails. They're different. Jacob shook his head. Different values, different outlooks on life. Wow, you have prejudices. Archie poured two cups of punch, handed one to Jacob. Actually, there are all kinds of people among them. I'm sure there are arrogant people, open-minded people, people who would kill for what they want, and others. Jacob asked, eager to change the subject, how was Ariana? Not so good, 
Archie replied grimly, always talking about how her son had been taken by the forest creatures. She was going crazy. Maybe she really did have a child and something happened to it. Jacob suggested on a sudden hunch. I have no idea, Archie answered. We don't have that information. But in any case, I'm afraid if this keeps up, we're going to have to send her to the clinic. How was the party? Nothing, Jacob nodded, nothing at all. They're keeping Frederick locked up at home, aren't they? Why? Archie wondered. They just changed the staff. The nanny they sent him to town with was irresponsible. You know, she broke up with her common-law husband that day. He called her, said that between them all over, that he even packed his things, take his mistress, suitcase, and fly to Egypt. Well, she snapped. She left the child alone in the street. Yeah, now she's not to be envied. That's right. Archie smiled grimly. She was so eager to stop him, I mean her boyfriend, that she just decided to stand in the middle of the road to stop a cab from passing. Jumped out instantly. She got hit. What? Jacob almost choked on her punch. Is she alive? She's alive. She's in the hospital. Sarah wanted to give her a good time, but she felt sorry for the fool and decided to keep it quiet, not to blame her. Sometimes she can be too soft-hearted. Ever since her parents died and her husband died, she's been a mess. Jacob had never been much of a gossip, but here he had a very strong desire to know more about Sarah's life. It was about as unbearable as if he'd eaten peppery chicken wings and needed a cool glass of water afterward. Archie outlined the situation in a few sentences it turned out that Sari's husband and her parents had died in a car accident just before everyone should have been happily on their way home with Frederick. And the baby? He was adopted, wasn't he? Jacob decided to clarify this obscure point. The thing it is, Archie said Sarah, well, he's adopted, but he's still a native. Anyway, he was born to a surrogate. I see Jacob nodded. As for his birth mother, well, it was complicated. All we know is that she decided to walk with the baby to the woods for some reason. You've heard of postpartum depression? Well, that's what it was. And then, well, she stupidly killed herself. All right, let's not talk about such gloomy topics anymore, Archie, and why are we still standing here? Come on, they're cutting the birthday cake. Let's go, Jacob said. But he still had something to say on the subject. But why did she tell Frederick? I mean, he's growing up with the realization that he's not really family. I don't think that's normal. It's just that Sarah thought it was better than him finding out from some well-wisher the nuances of his origins. He's had it all figured out since he was a kid. And then, it doesn't bother them. Frederick loves his mom, and she loves him. Jacob hadn't expected anything like this. He thought he'd just come to the party and that would be the end of it. So he was a little shocked when, seeing him off with the other guests, Sarah suddenly suggested that they exchange phone numbers, and he agreed, and falling asleep on Monday night, thought about the fact that it was, strange, but also very interesting, because, well, why would Sarah need his number? What if, was it just a gesture of courtesy, or was there a chance that if he asked her out for coffee, she wouldn't say no? Jacob had sent the business card of the man who'd offered him the job to the trash, and he didn't need a handout, but he kept Archie's card. He even agreed with him that they would go to Ariana's the other day, because Jacob suddenly thought that maybe his life really lacked something as small as good deeds. So he transferred a thousand dollars to the cat shelter's account, and with Archie's help, he decided to do a little charity work. A plastic window in Ariana's room had broken, and Jacob happened to know a little about fixing them, so he could be useful without spending a fortune. At work, Jacob was fortunate to have a normal atmosphere on Monday, and no one brought up the incident with Frederick's rescue. He did reports, looked at advertising layouts, though the latter was a little beyond his duties. He didn't get to Ariana's until Thursday night. Archie wasn't carrying grocery bags as much as last time. Have you thought about, you know, teaching a course, or at a private school? I've tried that, Archie replied, but I prefer the individualized approach. I think that's the only way I can fulfill my potential as a teacher. Well, here we are. Jacob looked around at the house with suspicion. It was clearly in need of repair, or maybe it should have been declared a wreck. Inside, the first impressions were replaced by second impressions and worse, by the acrid smell of basement junk and something sour. The communal apartment met with burned-out light bulbs and the hum of drunken voices in one of the rooms, but Ariana's room turned out to be amazingly clean and neat. The woman greeted the visitors with a smile, 
albeit one that was a dentist's worst dream, but a sincere one. A small refrigerator was found in her room, and the food was unloaded into it. Ariana put the kettle on. Jacob hastily said, or rather lied, that he was on a diet and couldn't drink tea or coffee. In fact, he couldn't imagine drinking anything from the cups that belonged to Ariana. Then, after accepting the work and thanking her, Ariana took a book off the shelf and sat. That's right, it's going to be okay, trust me. It's going to be all right, mom, I'll make it up to you. And they were silent, just staring into the dancing flames. Jacob was shocked when Sarah called him herself and said how about we go out for a cup of coffee. No, in general, he wasn't the kind of shy guy who shies away from the opposite sex like bunnies from chanterelles, not at all. However, after the divorce, Jacob, he'd gotten sidetracked temporarily out of the game, called a timeout, tried to focus on himself, and he didn't think he was ready for a romantic relationship. However, who says having a cup of coffee is anything romantic? It's nothing, it's just the way it is. Jacob had an explanation prepared for himself. Sarah must still have a strong sense of gratitude, so she wanted to verbally thank him again. So Jacob agreed to the meeting. They met in a small cafe on a summer veranda the wooden lattice walls of which were covered with something lushly blooming and sweet-smelling Jacob even sneezed. At first, they talked about the weather and how hard it was to work on spring days. Then Sarah shared the news about her son, who was well enough to learn English. Jacob, learning that Archie would be tutoring the boy, approved of the idea. And then suddenly, as if unnoticeably, Sarah moved on to questions about his personal life, and word by word, she asked him about his divorce and other troubles. I'm sorry, Jacob said, feeling silly for some reason, you're probably not interested. But I asked, the young woman said, and then she reached out and covered his hand. Jacob froze in place and rounded his eyes. Then he felt Sarah's shoe sliding up his leg under the table, almost to his knee. Don't, Jacob said, and pulled his feet away. Mmm, Sarah said, and a sleek smile curved her lips. You don't like it. Jacob had never felt so awkward in his life not even on his first date as a teenager, the first time he'd ever kissed a girl. He was just a defenseless mouse with a cat clawing around him in soft grasping paws. It's not that, he replied, trying to put a touch of dignity in his voice, but we? It's just that I'm used to saying things straight, she shrugged, and I like you. Why don't we try it? Jacob didn't ask what she was suggesting. He felt like a mouse being carried to the mall. I'm not used to women acting like that. I'm sorry if I gave you any reason to think I'd like that. In fact, I came to Frederick's birthday party then, not for you. That's what I thought, Sarah said. She fixed her hair and finally smiled not tempted but embarrassed. Perhaps I'm rushing things. Let's change the subject, shall we? Tell me more, what do you do? They tried changing the subject and it even kind of worked. Then Sarah said that Frederick missed his rescue very much. She told him that he had been given his first bicycle and was looking for someone to ride with. She added that she didn't know how to do it herself and wouldn't learn. And when she heard that Jacob knew how to ride, she suggested that maybe he could come over in his spare time. Would he help Frederick learn? Then finally, they finished their coffee and parted. Son, have you got a girlfriend? Mom asked him when he came to visit her on the weekend. No, Jacob said hastily. He'd never dreamed of revealing such details of his personal life to his mother. You're not like that. She shook her head with a cluck of her tongue. Look, son, you didn't listen to me, and I'm the one who got you. Oh, I can't bear a second one. You'll leave me to my grave, son. I won't have time to see my grandchildren. In short, the visit to my parents' house was as toxic as ever with the flavor of toxic gaslighting. The term gaslighting had been explained to Jacob by Steve, who had a passion for popular psychology. Then Jacob made up his mind and called Sarah, saying he could come over this weekend. Sarah smiled as she hung up the phone, which was great, because her son had gotten fed up, albeit in a good way, with her questions about Jacob. But she made a note to herself not to push the man. She'd been a naive, romantic girl, but then, everything had turned around and she changed. She grew teeth, grew a thicker skin to survive in the harsh world of business, to raise her son, and changed herself completely and only sometimes at all, mostly on lonely nights and in chilly, rainy mornings, and even on New Year's Eve, she missed the old Sarah, who believed in love, family, and all that. Sometimes when she looked at Frederick, she couldn't believe how fast time flew by. 
Only five years had passed. It seemed like an eternity. And Sarah knew that even if a thousand years passed, she would not be able to forget. Almost six years ago, she was so carefree and happy. She wanted to become a wife, a mother. Her beloved man was ready to carry her in his arms. He said that he was the luckiest man on earth because he had met her. And the more painful that was to tell him the truth. The thing was that once, taking tests just for fun, for prevention, to monitor her health, Sarah heard from the doctors that there was something wrong with her. At first she did not pay attention to it, but further examination showed something terrible. It turned out that for many years in her body lurked, without giving any indication, a rare pathology, because of which she could not bear and give birth to a child. Sarah thought that her lover would abandon her, but it did not happen Max said that they will still be together, that he agrees to take the child for adoption. Sarah, in principle, also found this option wonderful, but her parents were against it. They also hinted that in this case, they may even refuse to give up their daughter, take her out of the will. So they suggested surrogacy. Sarah did not really like this option. It seemed to her, there is something unnatural and immoral in allowing another woman to bear a child, give birth to it, and then take it away, reducing her nature-defined role of a mother to the role, in fact, incubator. But it suddenly became clear that the votes counted so one against three in deciding this issue. Because Sarah's favorite man was on her parents' side. And two, too late she realized what he was guided by he just didn't want to lose the fortune belonging to his future wife. Except Sarah didn't refuse. Thought about it, dreaded it, but she didn't. Sarah's family insisted that there should be complete anonymity in this case. They really wanted people to think that the future child was entirely Sarah's and under the pretext that at the beginning of married life is very important that the couple's life was calm, they sent Sarah and Max far away to another city, thus, counting on the fact that when they return with a baby to all acquaintances will be able to say that here, it was Sarah herself gave birth. They found a clinic, small, with a good reputation, and most importantly, according to rumors, able to keep secrets, the same clinic promised to find a surrogate mother, and such a woman was found. They met and Sarah and Max found this intelligent woman to be a very nice person in every way. All the planned procedures went well, and soon they were informed that the surrogate was pregnant. Everything seemed to be going well in life. The woman carrying the couple's child was placed in a nice apartment and provided with everything they needed. Everything was fine. Until one day, coming to visit her, the couple did not find out that she was missing. Naturally, they rushed to look for her. Found outside the city among the abandoned cottages, where she wandered in light clothes, although it was the end of summer and, in general, it turned out that the clinic did not tell the whole truth. It turned out that in the pursuit of profit, there slipped a woman who had big problems with mental health. It turned out that she grew up in a remote village and her own child died. Then, as the psychiatrist said, her consciousness began to break. In general, the woman now believed that the child she was carrying was her child. She didn't want to hear that she was a surrogate mother she intended to keep it for herself. Naturally, Sarah and her family were shocked. But if Sarah was just throwing tantrums and panicking, her mom, dad and husband acted more coolly. They decided that money would solve everything, and they began to prepare the necessary documents to look for specialists who could be bought. As a result, they arranged everything so that the surrogate mother could not object in any way to the fact that her child was taken away from her. Sarah herself, by the time she had the baby in her arms, she did not know how to treat him. On the one hand, he was long-awaited, loved, but she did not leave the feeling that she was just a monster who destroyed the life of a man. And then about the fact that Sarah is not pregnant, that she uses the services of a surrogate mother, found out her parents' acquaintances. Oh, in what it threatened to become a scandal, if they had learned that the surrogate mother does not want to part with the child. But, fate and chance decided otherwise. Literally 24 hours after the baby boy came into the world, the surrogate mom found an opportunity to escape from this private and elite clinic, and she took him with her. She was found outside of town. Again now she was racing toward the woods. She was going to, as she said, pick him up and take him with her to the baby's real father, the waterman. Well, she's obviously lost her mind. She was brought back. The child, of course, was taken away. But not even 24 hours later, the woman ran away again. Now she was alone. They were looking for her again and they didn't find her. They said that she went somewhere in the forest, in the swamps and there, well, she died. 
Because where do you expect a madman to survive in the woods on days when it's pouring with freezing rain? It took a while. Sarah's family could finally breathe a sigh of relief this woman was gone. She was declared dead altogether. Now the well-being of the new family member, the baby, nothing threatened. Of course, it was not possible to keep a complete secret, and now all the acquaintances of the family, business partners, in general, everyone knew about what Sarah had intimate problems. And then there was this car accident. They were all driving Sarah, her mom and dad, husband and baby. There was just a truck that blew a brake on the road. Its driver died on the spot, and in the other car, everybody died except Sarah and the baby. And that's how her life was turned upside down. She now had a new sense of purpose in her son. But at the same time, Sarah felt that she had lost something very important, that she wasn't a very good person. And as Frederick grew older, she realized more and more often that she wasn't giving him everything a truly good mother could give. And as for Jacob, yes, lately Sarah, she realized, had been very focused on her work. What kind of love is that? But she was young and her heart protested against the loneliness imposed by reason from a rational point of view. Jacob, of course, did not belong to the Aryan circle of men with whom she had had, well, you might say brief flings. He was an ordinary man, even with a troubled background of failed marriage, a troubled divorce, barely manageable loans. Sarah knew that if she wanted to, she could easily find a mate among men of his caliber. But there was something magnetic about Jacob. Maybe it was just the way he was. He didn't think he was better than he was. He didn't worship her beauty and success. He wasn't going to be attracted to her for the sake of physical intimacy. He was simple and, at the same time, he was strong. What? Sarah was brought out of her musings by the question he asked her. Right now, she was sitting in one of the rooms of the mansion, in front of a desk littered with business papers that urgently required her attention. And right now, while she was thinking, Archie was speaking to her. He had come for his first lesson with Frederick today, and now he was reporting on how the boy was coping with everything giving his professional opinion on his son's academic progress. Excuse me, smiled Sarah, could you repeat what you said last? Yes, of course, nodded Archie. I was talking about spending more time on listening and for that I suggest. Sarah was in agreement with everything, she just wanted to give her son the best, and the reviews of this tutor were very positive. And Archie was just quietly triumphant, he had managed to cope with one of the key stages of the plan to get into Sarah's house and start gaining her trust. Now the rest of the plan, as he believed, was to be realized quite easily. And in no more than a month or two, Archie had no doubt about it, the boy Frederick would be where he was supposed to be all along. Lately Ariana was getting worse. She understood less and less where the reality was and where the frightening fantasies were, and what was worst of all, more and more often came memories. Some of them were bright and kind. Here she is a very young girl, lives with her parents in the village, and although at home there is nothing to eat, or a drunken company, which is better not to get under the hot hand. But she loves them very, very much. And she believes that everything will be fine with them. Other memories were colored in more gloomy tones. Here she is already a young girl, she barely turned 18 and taking advantage of the long-awaited freedom. She leaves the city for the countryside. The money in her pocket is literally for a bus ticket and maybe to buy a cake and a glass of tea. But Ariana can't stay. Her parents are completely drunk already chasing all kinds of kikimura around the hut, going crazy. It's scary to live with them. It's scary to listen to the distant relatives who say that headaches are hereditary in their family and Ariana will suffer the same fate. No, she strongly disagrees with this and will do everything to prevent this from happening. That's why she runs to the city for a better life, for her piece of luck. And the big city seemed to welcome the provincial Ariana successfully entered an art school, moved into a dormitory and got a job, and in two places as a cleaner and a waitress. After all, it is necessary to spend no one to take care of her, except for herself. And then, love burst into Ariana's life. He was older, he was, well, just a man with whom she, so easily and badly, met on the bus. He came to the city to earn money, worked on construction sites, and it seemed to Ariana that they had so much in common. Grew up in the countryside, could not get used to the hectic rhythm of life in the metropolis. The romance began and brought the consequences of pregnancy. As soon as he found out, he just left town. Ariana was left all alone. She missed all the deadlines to solve this problem. And as she told her friends in the dormitory would not have the guts to take a little life. 
Naturally, life became much more difficult, and even the pregnancy was problematic. Ariana was malnourished, sleep-deprived, she had a premonition that something bad was going to happen, and so it happened her child was born weak, sick, and died when he was not yet three months old. But life didn't stand still. The final exams were coming up. The teachers and fellow students sympathized with Ariana, and she was walking around like a dream, a nightmare. And as if in accordance with the folk saying that misfortune does not come alone, Ariana received news from the village that her parents had died, drunk on stale vodka. One of her dormitory neighbors urged her to sell the village house for any price to try to get a foothold in the city. Ariana took the advice and even a realtor met a good one who helped her to get a decent amount of money for the house and land. Except that she couldn't buy anything in the city and Ariana started to slowly spend the money, paying for rented accommodation with it. And then, as if fate decided to compensate a little for all the suffering of the past days, Ariana got a job at a publishing house as an illustrator. Then it turned out that she was quite good at composing fairy tales based on folk tales, and two of her books were published. So Ariana lived slowly, to work, then home. She practically didn't communicate with anyone and lost contact with everyone she knew from the school. And then she met a woman. She met her at the women's clinic, where Ariana came with complaints that she thought she was pregnant, and when, by the way, the doctor asked her whether it was a husband or just a cohabitant, she answered that it was a cohabitant, but she kept silent that it was, well, not quite a man, since sometime Ariana began to have very realistic dreams that her talents to draw and compose fairy tales appeared to her not for nothing, but as a gift from the forest and swamp on cleanness. Much later, when Ariana was already seen by a psychiatrist, he said that these strange ideas arose against the background of her dysfunctional childhood and the fact that she wrote fairy tales about just such all water, kickimores, foresters, and other folklore characters. And so, Ariana at some point decided that this uncleanness wants to get a gift from her baby. And moreover, she began to see dreams in which the waterman himself came to her and made her his mistress. The doctor, having examined Ariana properly, told her that she was definitely, 100% not pregnant. Ariana left the office confused, and then she seriously thought that everything in her head was spinning strangely. She sat down to rest on a chair in the corridor, and then she met a woman. She introduced herself as Martha and said that she saw something wrong in Ariana's life. Martha asked her if she had ever given birth. Ariana answered in the affirmative, and then Martha said that basically there is one way to make a good, great living. I can see that you are not doing well, she said a little later, when she took Ariana to a cafe nearby, where she took her to lunch and watched her eat greedily, debts, perhaps. Ariana nodded. She had to take out a few loans to survive, because everything in town was so terribly expensive, and she had been fired from her publisher for absenteeism. Martha explained that there were some people in the world who wanted to be parents, but couldn't, and she, Ariana, could help them. Martha was an experienced recruiter. She knew how to find women to play the role of surrogate mothers. Some of them were even sent abroad, and Ariana had a place nearby in a neighboring town. Martha began to draw up all the necessary documents, and soon Ariana found herself in a private clinic. And for the first time to her own surprise, everything was fine and even wonderful. No worries, no troubles, nourishing, delicious food, a cozy apartment. But then the dreams returned, the intrusive thoughts. Ariana suddenly realized that watery he wanted a child her child. She refused to recognize that what she was carrying was someone else's child. Ariana was thrashing between two desires to run to the edge of the world, so that the wickedness would not take the baby, or maybe it would be better to carry it herself and together with him into the swamps, into the realm of the watermen to descend. Maybe they'll be better off there. They will eat the taina, play with crucians and gudgeons, sit on the shore with mermaids on moonlit nights and sing songs. And now, when Ariana was ready to fulfill this decision, she was stopped. Her baby was taken away, but she couldn't let herself be taken, and she ran again into the forest. She thought she would perish there because she had reached the swamps, but for some reason the waterman did not hurry to meet her. Ariana, not paying attention to the cold and rain, lay there for two nights, picking up cranberries with shaking hands and chewing some roots. She realized that without a child the waterman did not need her as a wife, and then, Ariana just went wherever she was going. She went deeper into the forest, and then, when her strength seemed to have completely left her, 
she met people. They were, well, in Ariana's previous life they would have been called hermits, crazy bums, but with these two brothers and one sister, who went away from the bustle of the city closer to nature, she finally found peace. They were strange people who communicated very little with each other and with her, only sometimes getting out of the forest to the villages to exchange mushrooms, berries and all the gifts of the forest for salt, sometimes bread and canned food. Ariana never went out with them always stayed in the dugout, in a clearing in the forest. So it lasted almost two years. And then, in the next winter everyone fell seriously ill, and one day other people came to the dugout, they called themselves volunteers and offered help. Those whom Ariana had already begun to consider her family. They betrayed her. They said that yes, they would go with the volunteers. Ariana resolutely refused. She gathered up her bundle of belongings and slipped away quietly from everyone's attention, going wherever she wanted to go again. She came to the city and lived with the homeless. Yes, that's how it worked out. Simple and nightmarish at the same time. Just lucky to run into those homeless people who had no foul designs on the lonely woman. Ariana lived in a dump, and it was also a strange time in her life. Clear consciousness was rare and such days brought special suffering because she remembered everything that happened to her. But then again everything changed in Ariana, keeping in touch with reality on threads thinner than Pautine, figuratively speaking, plunged into her inner world. She could tell tales for hours, which she made up on the fly. She could draw for hours, and there was no need for expensive paints. You could even paint with charcoal, for example. And then in the spring, Ariana suddenly felt the urge to change places, and she realized she needed to go to another city, to the place where her carefree, bright youth had passed, and since this place of residence did not hold her anything, it was easy to do it. Well, relatively it was necessary to overcome such a distance, but somehow she overcame it, where on foot, and where a trucker gave her a ride. He took pity on her. She told him fairy tales all the way, and he marveled at how cleverly she could compose them. He bought her some food when they stopped at a gas station and gave her a thousand in cash when he dropped her off. Back in the city of her youth, Ariana went wandering around it. Then, when the money ran out, it turned out that here, as in neighboring towns, you can't ask for alms, all the places are occupied, and no one was going to let a stranger own them. Ariana was already despairing, she felt lost, did not recognize many places that had changed over the years. But then destiny as a gift tossed one day one grandfather homeless man suggested that here, say, there is a charitable foundation gives out lunches. Ariana began to come there often. And little by little she began to trust these people, and they decided to help her. They said that they could seriously support her documents and help her recover, so that Ariana could go to work. Ariana was afraid of such responsibility, irresponsibility for her own fate, and disappeared for a while. And when she returned, the new kind-hearted acquaintances, apparently, decided not to put pressure on her and decided to help in another way. One of the women who worked in the fund, named Selena, said that she owns a room in a communal house on the outskirts. The neighbors are not very good, the house is a wreck, but it's a place to live, and she said that maybe Ariana would agree to try to get back to normal after all. Well, if change scares her so much, let her just live like a human being first, and then she would restore her documents and get a job. Ariana agreed, and that's how she found herself in a room in a communal apartment. It was so strange, surprising and wonderful at the same time to be able to visit the bathroom, to cook herself a hot uncomplicated meal on the stove. Everything slowly seemed to be getting better. But then Selena suddenly said that she had to leave for a family emergency. She instructed Ariana to continue living in this room and left her in the care of the other members of the charity, mainly Archie. He was new to the foundation. He just turned up one day, made a donation, and said he wanted to help people. Well, he was given an assignment in the person of Ariana. Archie was polite, alert. He didn't mind lingering at Ariana's place to talk. Oh, how sweetly they talked. He asked questions, she answered and told him about her life. For the last years Ariana had never had another listener as sensitive as Archie seemed to be ready to listen to her tales about the forest's wickedness without end. He was so caring, so kind, and one day Ariana confided to him her main secret, her great secret, which she had never told anyone since she had fled from the clinic. She was afraid that Archie would not believe her, would laugh. But he only listened to her very carefully, and then he took her hand, looked into her eyes and said that he would take care of her. 
Ariana believed him. She listened to Archie in many ways. He was so kind to her. So, unlike Selena, he didn't mind her going out for a walk in the city. He didn't even scold her when she told him about what she had seen, seeing her boy being dragged into the canal by the waterman. He just laughed and said that sometimes life had such curious coincidences, and then he promised Ariana that her life would soon change. Jacob really didn't believe that anything worthwhile could come out of this seemingly bizarre relationship, and so he came to visit Sarah without any doubts. Well, formally and mostly he came to Frederick, but soon he could no longer conceal from himself that he was waiting to meet, mainly with his mother, but Jacob kept telling himself, it was nothing serious, it's not like they're in love, they're just buddies, well, maybe with a touch of flirtation, but it's all safe, because he's a grown man and he's not stupid enough to believe that he could have a future with a business lady and a millionaire. Yes, Jacob was now very glad to have a new thing in his life like these visits, and several times the three of them, he, Sarah, and Frederick, met in the city. They walked in the park, went on rides and even visited the zoo. They had a great time together. And gradually, it all began to feel like something, almost normal. Jacob relaxed and let himself be carried away by the new flow of events. I'm sorry, he said, sneezing loudly. On this day, when he'd stopped by Sarah and Frederick's house to go roller skating, and more importantly, to try to fly a kite on such a windy day, Jacob hadn't been feeling well since morning but he didn't care, figuratively speaking, about his own well-being. And this was the result. By evening, when it was time to leave, he seemed to be running a fever and had a nasty little chill all over his body. It's 40 degrees, Sarah shrieked, putting her palm to his forehead. I don't think so, Jacob replied, his innocent gesture of concern suddenly sending shivers down his spine. There's a flu going around town right now, she frowned. Frederick and I are immunized against it. Have you been immunized? No, Jacob answered, and added hastily, I don't believe it. He couldn't really be telling the truth about being afraid of shots. And where are you going in your condition? Sarah grumbled. No, let's do it this way. You'll spend the night at our place, take your medicine, I'll order a delivery from the pharmacy, and tomorrow you can go home. You have the weekend off anyway. There was nothing to object to, but Jacob was so sick of the idea of taking a cab or public transportation home in the evening traffic. So he agreed. They had dinner together. Jacob barely nibbled on what was on his plate. Then Sarah took him to the guest room. And he fell asleep. He woke up unusually late, judging by the sun in the window. Jacob came downstairs. Frederick was sitting in the living room with a book, but he put it down as soon as he saw his adult companion. Good afternoon, said the maid who had just arrived. The mistress has already left for the office. Would you like some breakfast? Shall I call the doctor? Thank you, a cup of tea would be fine. I don't have an appetite. Jacob replied, no, I don't need a doctor. I should go home. What about me? Frederick pouted. You promised we play construction. The boy reminded him that he wanted to play with Jacob's new set of construction vehicles. Jacob sighed, deciding that it didn't make much difference where he spent his day off. It was better than being home alone. It wasn't an option to go to his mother's house because when Jacob was sick, she wouldn't even let him in. The maid said that the mistress had strictly instructed Jacob not to go hungry, and they had to agree that chicken soup was very good for him in his condition. Then he and Frederick went out to the garden, and the weather was fine. I forgot the excavator, explained Frederick, ring it, eh? Asked the boy, diligently loading sand into the back of the truck. Where did you lose it? At my mom's office, answered Frederick. Jacob nodded. He was already aware that Sarah was very free with the mess her son was capable of making, and toys could be lined all over the house. The door to Sarah's study was not normally locked and he walked in freely, and froze, because Archie was there. There was nothing unusual about the tutor being in the mansion, he came several times a week to study with Frederick, but he had no place in the landlady's study when she was away, and he had no place near the safe, which Archie was just, trying to open like a thief. At first, he and Jacob locked gazes. I can explain. Archie was the first to break the silence. It's not what it looks like. The phrasing sounded trite, like a line from a cheap Hollywood movie. Jacob closed the door behind him and frowned. What can you explain? In fact, he hadn't quite figured out how to react to the situation himself. Archie was. No, he didn't like him, but he'd seemed like a normal guy all along. 
His charity work, by the way, Jacob hadn't really been involved in lately, but life had taken a turn for the worse, and yet Jacob could have sworn that Archie was anything but a thief, not an intruder of any kind. An odd intellectual, yes, a bit of an intellectual, and right now Jacob was trying to figure out if he'd been so wrong about this guy. They were standing opposite each other, and Jacob suddenly thought of the comparison that in the wilderness, two beasts of prey would face each other, and frozen against each other, assess their opponent, deciding whether it made sense to attack and how to do it in the best possible way to win. In this particular situation, however, it made more sense that Archie was the top predator. Jacob, on the other hand, felt more like, well, let's say a deer or a boar. Can I trust you? Can you keep a secret? Secrets that really matter. Archie did the following in succession. He closed the safe, put the painting that covered it back in place, pulled off his gloves, and approached Jacob. It seemed to Arian that he seemed to be trying to be manipulated, but he answered, and he answered in the affirmative. Then let's pretend right now that you didn't see anything, Archie said, and meet. I'll explain everything to you, but not here. Just trust me. A lot of things aren't what they seem. Jacob opened his mouth and closed it. I wonder how many choices there are in this situation. He could tell Sarah everything. What exactly to tell her? Howard Tudor tried to break into the safe in her office for some reason, but Archie didn't look like a common thief at all, and though he didn't understand what was going on, it seemed to Jacob that this was really about something specific. He nodded and said he'd agree to that condition. Actually, that's what I came for, he added, and picked up a toy car from the side table. All right, Archie said. When you're done playing, Frederick and I have an English lesson planned. Are you sick, by the way? I'm on the mend. Jacob replied, sniffling, afraid of getting sick. Oh, believe me, Archie said with a chuckle as he walked past him to leave the office, there's not much in this life I'm afraid of, and it's certainly not getting sick. When Sarah came home later and Archie had already left, Jacob had to bite his tongue to keep from telling her what had happened, but he held on. First of all, because he'd given his word. Second, because, well, theoretically, he hadn't known Archie that long, but he had a favorable impression of him and it seemed to him that maybe there was something serious and important going on here. And Jacob knew he would have answers to all his questions in the very near future. They agreed to meet the next day. They went to the pizzeria and sat down at a table. Jacob loved pizza. When he was a kid, he remembered it well. His mom always said it was bad for him. She said pizza ruined his stomach. And little Jacob couldn't understand why a sausage sandwich was healthy, but pizza wasn't. Sometimes he saved up money from school lunches to go for his favorite food. Then when he was a student, he ate pizza more freely, and then he often went to such places. But today, a piece didn't fit in his throat. And Archie as if on purpose took to torture him, he himself ate with apparent pleasure and then talked about distant things. For example, about how things were going in the charity fund and how he continued to visit Ariana, who was getting worse. I think it's time you found out what's really going on, he said, leaning back on the couch and folding his arms across his chest. He gave Jacob a questioning look, saying, are you ready for the truth? Jacob didn't answer, just nodded. And Archie began to speak. He began by emphasizing that in order to understand the present, it was important to go back to the past. It turned out that Sarah's husband was not an easy man. At first glance, he was a wealthy man, a businessman. But in essence, he was a rebel. He could have run the family business as the eldest son, but refused to do so in order to do science. He wanted to become an astronomer. His mother, as Archie said, supported his ambition out of pity, but she waited for him to come to the senses. Instead, he decided to marry a girl in secret, and it was Sarah. Max knew that his mother would not approve of this union because Sarah's family. Well, it just so happened that their families had been feuding since the time of their great-grandfathers. Jacob interrupted him at this point, asking, What is this nonsense? What kind of feud in the modern world based on family history? Archie said that you shouldn't judge someone else's traditions if you don't understand them, and he went on with the story. He said that Max's mother had lived abroad for a long time. She didn't know that her son decided to have a child this way through a surrogate mother. She found out about it only after all this tragedy happened, and she turned to Sarah with such a proposal that her grandson should not be brought up, raised apart. But Sarah decided they didn't need a grandmother. So she refused to have any contact with Frederick. And then Frederick's grandmother decided that she would have her grandson. 
Here Archie firmly, clearly explained that it was not about some dirty things like kidnapping. Not at all. But just, is that fair? To finally betray your husband's memory like this by denying his mother the right to see her hair. Why do you care? Jacob asked. I'm the second son. Max's younger brother, Archie replied, and Frederick is my nephew. And then before Jacob could digest what he'd heard, he went on, and he told him that he wasn't really a tutor. I mean, he had excellent English, but that it was just a skillful cover to gain the trust of Sarah's entourage, and then of Sarah herself. But as Archie said, he helps his mother run the family business and is her only living child and main heir. This was made possible by the fact that Archie had never seen Sarah before, he, like his mother, spent a lot of time abroad and was not invited to his brother's wedding. What are you going to do? Jacob asked, as if instinctively sensing that Archie was getting to the most important part of his story, and at the same time the most difficult and even frightening part, and most importantly, why are you telling me all this? Because you care about this family. Do you think it's completely invisible? Archie grinned. The way you've grown attached to the boy. Unfortunately, there aren't many people that my mother and I can trust. But you, that's something special. You seem to be praising, but you seem to be insulting. Jacob squinted. More like the former. So why do you think I'm helping Ariana? Because you're in the charity? Jacob suggested, but the next thing he knew, his eyes widened at the realization, wait, are you saying that Ariana and that woman, the surrogate mother, are the same person? That's right, Archie nodded. It turned out that Archie had done his own and very long investigation. He didn't believe that the surrogate mother had disappeared into the moors and set out to find her. It took more than a year, but he finally got on the trail, and he found Ariana, and now, now. Jacob didn't understand what the plan was yet. And when it was explained to him, he was shocked. It turned out that Archie and his mother had decided that they could arrange it so that they could get Ariana to admit that she didn't want to give up the baby and that she was not in her right mind when she agreed to be a surrogate. Theoretically, of course, all this was insanely complicated, but Frederick's grandmother hoped that in this way, it would be possible to create a tangible threat to Sarah, because the child would have a real mother, who would have some rights, for example, at least to see him. But that was not all. Besides, Frederick's grandmother intended to get custody of Ariana. Again taking advantage of the fact that they were in fact very distant relatives, because Ariana had carried a child that belonged to her son. And so, having Ariana in her power, who was clearly in over her head, she intended to gain a powerful leverage over Sarah, and as a result, and as a final goal, she wanted Frederick to live with her. You're out of your mind, Jacob said when he had heard everything. Really? Grinned Archie unkindly. What do you think we should do in this situation? Jacob opened his mouth, then closed it. He couldn't answer that question so easily. He only knew that what was being proposed was something monstrous and wrong. Why did you tell me all this, Aren't? Aren't you afraid I'll tell Sarah everything? Theoretically, it's possible, Archie said, looking at him coldly, but you see the thing is, even if you do, it won't change anything. That knowledge, believe me, won't do anything for her. It'll only get on her nerves, and if I tell you the truth, at least I have a chance to gain an ally. But if that's not the case, well, it's your decision what to do with that information. But be warned, you can't do anything about it. Jacob got up. He needed to leave now. He needed to think about it. Because his life had taken a sharp turn. Even though it didn't seem to concern him at all, because it was someone else's family problem. He knew he couldn't stay out of it. He just couldn't. Jacob had never thought of himself as a superhero, nor had he ever dreamed of being one. He could barely keep up in the usual conflicts with his mother. And what could he do now? And yet, he came home. He drank two cups of black coffee, and he dialed Sarah's number with determination. He said they needed to talk urgently. One-on-one, -on, -one, on a matter of the utmost importance. Sarah was in town at her office and had invited him to stop by her place of work. Jacob was there in a flash. He ignored a call from his mother, who left a voice message saying she wished him a speedy recovery and advised him to heal by eating a vitamin mix of raw onions and honey. Jacob would have been furious at the advice, but now he just ignored it. What's wrong? Sarah asked him when he walked into her office. We need to talk and can you promise me that you'll listen to me first before you react and especially before you do anything? Well, I can of course, 
Sarah twirled the pen nervously in her fingers. But what's wrong? And that's when Jacob spoke. He recounted everything he'd learned, very briefly, and then he told her everything he thought about it. She pulled down the blinds on the windows of her office and paced the room like a caged animal. Jacob kept talking and talking. Then they argued fiercely, but then, the young woman took a paper handkerchief to wipe away the tears in her eyes. All right, let's do as you say, but I want to send Frederick on the first flight to a private boarding house in Switzerland. He'd be perfectly safe there. But you know that's not an option, Jacob said. And then he did something he would never have dared to do before. When he came to her and put his hands on her shoulders and looked into her eyes, he said, trust me, it's going to be okay. And then he kissed her forehead. The next day, Jacob called Archie and talked to him and he experienced some pleasure that Archie was shocked at his suggestion. Archie said that actually, it wasn't at all what he had hoped for. You know, Jacob said, I know what it's like to go along with your relatives, and I can say the same thing about you as you can about me. You're already attached to Frederick too. No matter what you say, no matter how you cover it up, you don't want to hurt the boy. And your plan, you realize it would ruin his childhood. That's why I'm suggesting an alternative, there's still a way to make things right. I wish I could believe all this, Archie said after a pause, but it all seems too simple to be true. Sometimes the simplest things are the most real. So how? Can we come? Decide quickly. Okay, sighed Archie after a new and much longer pause. A couple hours later, a car stopped at the gates of the mansion and then drove into the grounds. Three people got out Sarah, who was holding Frederick's hand, and Jacob. Archie had pulled up almost at the same time as them and now he pressed the bell button. A maid opened. After greeting her, Archie entered the house. The small company followed him. They passed the hallway, the corridor, and entered the room without knocking. Archie? What? The woman sitting in the wheelchair by the window, who had been reading the book before the arrival of her son and the uninvited guests, looked genuinely shocked. She looked from her grandson to her daughter-in-law, then to her son and Jacob. Frederick. Sarah gently nudged the boy forward meet. This is your grandmother. What does all this mean? Exclaimed the little boy's grandmother. That it's time to end our feud, replied Sarah calmly, and I want you to know, I'm not doing this because I'm afraid of you. If, if you were to do what you have in mind, I wouldn't give up so easily, but I, I just don't want enmity. I want, I realize now that I want my son to have a full normal family. I'm tired of, of us living apart and of him growing up without a grandmother. And I'm, I'm willing to let go of all the bad things that happened between us, if you're willing to do the same. Jacob understood what was happening too much. Not that it wasn't real, because it was happening here and now in this world. No, the problem was different. He wanted it, but he almost didn't believe that a long-standing conflict could be resolved in such an easy way, a family reconciliation. Jacob had seen firsthand that it was a fantasy, and once you tried to do it, it just got worse. Jacob realized that this family's affairs were none of his business, but he couldn't stay out of it yet. He understood that Sarah was a grown, self-sufficient woman. She ran the business, but he also realized, again from his own experience, how important it was that suddenly and one day, in a particularly difficult moment, there was a person who could tell you what to do in a given situation. He knew sometimes it was so difficult to decide to do the right thing, but it was necessary, because it will turn your life around for the better. He himself had gone through this when he had almost had a fight with his parents because of his failed marriage, under the influence of his ex-wife. It had been a long and in many ways impossible conversation. Frederick had been sent to another room for the duration of the conversation, which the maids had justly decided was not good for children's ears. Jacob didn't regret having started all this, but he wanted to get out, just to keep his relatives from talking. But Sarah clung to his arm, letting him know that she wouldn't let him go, so he stayed. It was a very long conversation. After all, it was not only about reconciliation of quarreling relatives, but about clarification of relations between people who were on the verge of violent enmity, beyond all limits. It was not easy for Sarah to admit how wrong she was when she decided that her grandson should not communicate with his grandmother because her dead husband had been in a quarrel with her. And it wasn't easy for Frederick's grandmother to admit that it would be too cruel to deprive the boy of his mother like that. We also talked about Ariana. Yes, she probably didn't really understand what was going on at some points, but Sarah said confidently that at the time of signing the contract for the surrogate mother, 
Ariana was quite sane for her and her husband's peace of mind, and this was confirmed by an independent specialist psychiatrist. Probably at that time Ariana did not have such permanent problems with her mind. And yet, of course, it was a huge problem. But finally they agreed that Ariana should be given the best possible treatment, and that she should be in a private, really good clinic where they could work with such disorders. They also decided that when she recovered, she would be able to see Frederick, but it would have to be arranged in such a way that it would not be traumatic for the boy. Finally, the conversation was over. Sarah, Jacob, and Frederick left the mansion. We need to have a serious talk, Sarah said to Jacob a few days later, when he stopped by, as was his habit, to seek her. About what? He asked. It wasn't that you wasn't ready to keep dealing with all these problems, but Jacob admitted to himself, secretly, that he was tired of it. But Sarah, as if she read his mind, hastily added that the subject had nothing to do with the family history. I've made inquiries about your job, she said, and I want you to quit. Why? Jacob didn't understand. What do you mean you want me to quit? I don't understand. I mean that with your education and skills you are capable of so much more, replied Sarah, you know, I have just the right position in my firm. Don't take offense, okay? But I did some checking, and it looks like you're stuck in your old position. Jacob couldn't agree more, but it didn't feel right to accept such help. But Sarah insisted. And if all goes well, in the long run, I might even need a personal assistant. You don't have one now? Yes, a very nice girl. But unfortunately, she is going to maternity, Sarah smiled. You will have about six months to prove yourself and get this position. Do you want the truth? He asked, and when she nodded, he stepped closer to her. I don't care about this position, and I'm not interested in your money or your firm. That's a bold and pleasantly honest statement, Sarah smiled. I suppose you'll tell me that you're only interested in me, my soul. That you're just hand over heels in love with me. What? Jacob's jaw nearly dropped at that virgin. But admittedly, Sarah was very close to the truth. Why do men have to be so timid? She asked with an affectionate grin, and then, suddenly she reached up to kiss him. It was the lightest, most innocent kiss, but Jacob felt the ground slipping away from under his feet. It was just beautiful, a thousand times better than he'd imagined. I, yes, I think I've fallen in love, he finally said when it was over. What are we going to do about it? Sarah asked looking at him from under her eyelashes. I don't know, it's so complicated. And I think, after you help me protect my son. It's very simple, she replied. What do you suggest? Jacob asked. Just live. Just be together. And then, just keep going. Isn't that the best part of creating your life together day by day? Isn't that what you want? Yes, that's exactly what he answered her after a short pause. Thank you for watching this video to the end. Subscribe to the channel, like it, write comments if you like the story, and see you on the channel.